So this is our second video in biology and last video we just did an introduction to biology. Now we're gonna be talking about the chemistry of life. Now I mentioned previously that this is more of an AP course than a high school course. And this is one of the parts where it is more advanced. I'm gonna go a bit more in depth than what high schools would teach you. Talking about um, electron shells and most of this you'll only learn in chemistry, not biology but it's good to know more. So first matter and chemistry. Matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. So I am matter, you are matter, air is even matter. It doesn't have to be visible. You can't see air, but it still takes up space and it still has mass even though you don't think about it. An element is matter that cannot be broken down into other substances. So it's the smallest possible matter. And there are 92 natural elements, but there are 108 total elements. Some of them are synthesized by humans. The essential elements are necessary for life. So an example of an element is hydrogen. That's probably the most common one. Hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, helium, these are the most common elements. There's nitrogen, chlorine. Essential elements are necessary for life. And carbon is one of the most essential elements as you'll see in our next video. Trace elements are required by organisms but in small quantities like sulfur. A compound is something, a substance that contains two or more elements in a fixed ratio. So water, which as you'll see, can be written by the formula H2O, is a compound because H is hydrogen, O is oxygen. So the fixed ratio is two hydrogens to one oxygen. So technically, hydrogen can also be written as H4O2. But this is less common because we usually want to keep it the smallest ratio possible. But this is also a molecule of hydrogen. It's actually two combined. It has different characteristics than the elements it's made of. And the most common example you'll see is salt. Because salt, table salt, is NaCl. So that's sodium. that's chlorine. Sodium by itself is a dangerous metal. It's poisonous, while chlorine is a poisonous gas. Sodium, if you put it in water, it'll catch on fire. That's how dangerous sodium is. But when you mix them together, we get salt, which we probably use every single day of our lives. It's amazing how chemistry works. An atom is the smallest unit of matter that retains the properties of an element. So one atom is just one unit of element. Because an element cannot be broken down, that's a similar definition to an atom. If you break down an atom, you get substances that don't have the property of the element. Subatomic particles, they make up an atom. Like I said, if you break down an atom, you get subatomic particles. These don't have the properties of the element. A proton has a positive charge. And here's the mass of a proton. I'm not gonna say it out loud because it's 1.7 times blah, blah, blah. And main thing to know, it has a positive charge. Neutron on the other hand has no charge while electron has a negative charge. And as you'll see soon, an atom always has, or more like usually has, um, a neutral atom always has the same number of protons and electrons. So it has a neutral charge. That's why it's called a neutral atom. You'll also see charged atoms that have a few more protons or electrons than the other. The atomic nucleus is the center of the atom and it's made up of protons and neutrons. This is the majority of the mass because the electrons that orbit the nucleus, they don't weigh much. As you can see, it's 2000 times less than a proton or a neutron. 
while a proton and neutron have approximately the same mass. Like I said, electrons orbit the nucleus. The atomic number of an uh, atom is the number of protons, which is also equal to the number of electrons. And hydrogen has one proton, which means it has one electron. The drawing of hydrogen, you can draw it something like this. This is the nucleus. This has one proton. You'll see soon that it has no neutrons, just one proton and then one electron circling it. And this is the orbit, also called the electron shell. But more on that later. The mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And isotopes, atoms with varying numbers of neutrons. So back to mass number for a bit. If you've ever seen a periodic table, you'll notice that there's a little number. For example, hydrogen says one. And that is the atomic number. But you also see a number that says 1.008 usually. So if this is hydrogen, it says one up here, that's the atomic number. But it also says 1.008. And this is the atomic mass, which is not the same thing as mass number because mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if it has one proton, how can I have 0.008 neutrons? Atomic mass is slightly different and it has to do with isotopes. So isotopes are atoms with varying numbers of neutrons and hydrogen has three isotopes. The most common one is hydrogen itself with a mass number of one. It's called H1. And then there's an isotope hydrogen with a mass number of two and this is called deuterium. And then hydrogen with a mass number of three. Two and um, these two aren't really found that common. So that's why, as you'll see, the atomic mass is 1.008. So atomic mass is the weighted average of all the isotopes. So it's not just one plus two plus three. That's just the sum. The average would be one plus two plus three over three. That it's still not that because that'll be two. Keyword weighted average. And weighted average means it includes the abundancy. And the abundancy of hydrogen one is approximately 99%. That's a lot. Which is why these two aren't found that common. And the mass, atomic mass is 1.008. It's closer to one than the others because there's almost 99% hydrogen one. Radioactive isotopes, they're unstable and they decay spontaneously. And they're re really useful in medicine because if you just inject some radioactive isotopes into someone's body, okay, that sounds a bit creepy, but still, you'll know where, you can then take an x-ray and see where the isotopes are. So if you want to know where there's a problem or where there's less isotopes, normal isotopes, you inject the radioactive isotopes, see where they are using the x-ray, and you'll know that's where there's the um, problem. Moving on, electrons. So we talked a bit about electrons, but there's so much more to electrons, as you'll know in our chemistry series, which starts a few months later. Electrons are the only particles that are involved in chemical reactions. Chemical reactions, reactions between molecules. Energy is the capacity to cause change. And each electron has a different energy and this is called the energy level of the electron. Potential energy is the energy based on location or structure. So matter has a tendency to move to the lowest state of potential energy. I mean, it makes sense. You don't, you'd rather be on the first floor than the 20th floor when you fall. Electrons have potential energy because of the arrangement and attraction to the nucleus. So if this is the nucleus, we can have little 
electrons here. Now, the model I showed you with the ring, that's slightly simplified. Electrons can actually be anywhere in the, oops, anywhere in this ring. The arrangement, so it's the location towards the nucleus. That's why they have potential energy. Electron shells, like I said, it's the electrons energy levels. And the first shell has the lowest potential energy. So let me use that simplified diagram again. This is not completely accurate, but it will do for a basic course. This is the first shell. And it has the lowest potential energy because I mean, it's the first shell, so it's the closest. If you had a second shell, then this would have more potential energy because it's farther away. So its attraction is greater. That's why it increases with each shell. It's like a ladder. It goes up in fixed amounts. So if the second shell is the same distance away from the first shell, then it goes up by a fixed amount. Electrons can change shell by absorbing or losing energy. So it's like if I'm climbing a ladder and I observe energy, then I go up. I have a higher potential energy, so I go up one rung. But if I go down a rung, then I'm losing energy. I'm losing potential energy. The lower you are, the less potential energy you have. Electrons are the main cause of the chemical behavior of an element. And main thing, each shell has slightly varied amounts of electrons. So the first shell has two maximum. So hydrogen, like we saw, only has one in the first shell. But helium has two in the first shell. The second, and then lithium, the third element, has to have a second shell. And this, it has one. Then the next element has two, then so on and so forth. And the next shell can hold a maximum of eight electrons. And then the shell after that can hold a maximum of eight electrons. Oh, these are horrible shells. Anyway, a valence electron is on the, an electron in the valence shell. And the valence shell is the outermost shell. So in hydrogen and helium, the valence shell is just the first shell. But after that, it becomes the second shell or the third shell, whichever is the outermost. Chemical reactions take place so that each atom can fill its valence shell. Filling the valence shell makes an um, atom stable. An electron orbital is the accurate diagram of electron shells, and this is a 3D diagram. So unlike those little 2D circles that I drew, this is an actual accurate diagram. And these show where an electron could possibly be. And we don't really know where an electron is at a certain time, but we'll know that it could be in this cloud, the electron cloud. It could be anywhere in this orbital. The first shell is just called 1s, and it's a spherical shape. Since it's 3D, it has an x axis, a y axis, and a z axis. So this is the first shell. The second shell is 2s. So it has a spherical, and then it has three 2Ps. And 2Ps are dumbbell shaped. So we have one more spherical. And then we have three dumbbell shapes. And now the reason we have three is because it can either go on the x-axis, the z-axis, or the y-axis. Oh. So 
So S's are always spherical and P's are always dumbbell shaped. The third shell is 3S and 3, 3P's. So for a moment, just ignore the coefficient. Just ignore it. Just think S and then 3P's or and 3P's. So it's the same dumbbell shapes and the same spherical one. So the third shell is the same thing as the second shell. But now we come to the coefficients. And the coefficients are just to show which shell it is. That's the distinguishing between these two. There's a maximum of two electrons per orbital, not per shell, but per orbital. And for example, if this is the orbital, one goes up, one goes down. This is slightly more advanced. It gets into chemistry. But this is how uh, orbital looks like. So the first shell would have this one orbital. The second shell, since it can hold eight electrons, it has four orbitals a spherical one and three dumbbell shaped ones. Third shell, same thing, a spherical one and then three dumbbell shaped ones. Like we said before, reason for chemical reactions is electrons and unpaired electrons specifically are the ones involved in chemical reactions. And this is because they want to be paired. They want to fill up the orbital and the shell. Now we get into bonding, S still to do with electrons, but not directly. And chemical bonds are attractions between atoms. And like I said, this has to, this is mainly because of electrons. Covalent bonds is the first type of bonds and it's the sharing of valence electrons. So it's not just a give or take, it's sharing. If this is a hydrogen and this is another hydrogen, the covalent bond between them, they want to another electron to fill up this shell. They each can hold two electrons in this shell. So they only want one more. So if this just gives it to it, then this won't be, it'll just be a nucleus. I mean, it won't be complete. This would, but this won't. Therefore, they have to share it. They have to share it and it looks something like this. If this, is the attraction between them. Now this one has these two and this one has these two. A molecule is a compound bounded by chemical um, covalent bonds. It says chemical bonds here, but most molecules are bonded by covalent bonds. Molecular formula indicates the elements and the ratios. So like I said, H2O would be a molecular formula. It indicates the elements, hydrogen and oxygen, and the ratio, two to one. Structural formula indicates the elements, ratio, and the bond type. So you will see this later, but a Lewis formula is a type of structural formula. And it shows that this is a covalent bond. Oops. This is a covalent bond. Notice there's only one bond, even though two electrons were shared. Think of this as one electron and this is the other electron. So this is the bonding between the electrons. There is only two electrons shared. Like I said, Lewis dot structure. It also shows the valence electrons. So for example, if there's an ele element X that bonds with this element X, it might not be complete because there might still be a valence electron. Now, if this was the case, then another bond would just form and there won't be any other valence electrons left. But say it was something like X to another element Y, Y is all filled, but X still has one ele um, valence electron left. This is an example of a loose dot structure with valence electrons. A single bond is a pair of, pair of shared electrons, just one. Two electrons are shared and they're connected. Double bond is two pairs of shared electrons. So oxygen looks something like this. 
it has two pairs because it it has six valence electron it needs two more so it gets these two this one gets these two that's a double bond and the bonding capacity or valence is the number of covalent bonds an atom can form so hydrogen has a bonding capacity of one because it can it can only take in one other electron it can only share one and this is usually the number of unpaired electrons electron negativity is the attraction of atom to electrons in covalent bonds and h2o looks something like this This is an example of the structural formula. As you'll see soon in the next video, H2O it has electronegativity, unequal electronegativity. Electro has to do with electrons, and negativity is the attraction they form. Nonpolar is when the atoms have equal electronegativity, but polar is when they have unequal. So like I said, water would be polar because they have unequal electronegativity. This is unbalanced. Another type of bond is ionic bonds. And in this, electrons are just given and taken. They're not shared. An ion is a charged atom. So an ion forms when an electron is either given or taken. So a cation is when the electron is given, so the charge is positive. And an anion is when the electron is taken, so the charge is negative. An ionic compound, also called salt, is a compound that's bonded ionically. And polyatomic ion is not the same thing because it's a molecule, but it's charged. So it's not exactly an ionic compound it's not the bonding of two ions. It's the bonding of two atoms that create a molecule, but electrons are either given or taken. So it's polyatomic. It's a molecule. It's charged. An example of ionic bonding, pretty famous one, salt. It says it in the name. Table salt is NaCl. And Na has one valence electron, but Cl has seven. So the ion of this would be Na plus. The valence electron is given away. And the ion of this would be Cl minus. An electron is taken to fill the shell. And therefore, this is a cation and this is an anion. They'll bond to form table salt. Some other chemical bonds, they're relatively weak and they're usually between molecules. They don't connect atoms to form molecules, but they're between molecules. An example is hydrogen bond. And it's the non-covalent attraction between H, a hydrogen, and another atom, usually F, N, or O. So since these are between molecules, if this is oops, one molecule of H2O, this isn't a hydrogen bond. This is covalent bond. But if there was another molecule of H2O right here, then there would be a hydrogen bond right here. We'll talk more about this in the next lesson when we talk about water and its properties. Van der Waals interaction, and this is when atoms and molecules are very close together. And a famous example is a gecko climbing up a wall. Geckos, they use their feet and they use Van der Waals interactions so that they can get the stickiness to climb up the wall. The molecular shape of a molecule is the structure that affects its function. It's determined by the position and hybridization of orbitals. This sounds pretty complicated, and it is. It's advanced chemistry. So we'll just go a bit into it. 
two atoms, then it'll be linear. So this would be the molecular shape. For example, H and H is linear. H2O is bent. And this is a, sorry, not O, H. This is water and it's a bent shape. It's not linear, it's bent. This angle is approximately 104.5 degrees. CH4 is a tetrahedron. CH4 or methane looks something like this. C is in the middle. And then there are little H's coming out of it. So it's hard to draw this, but it's a 3D shape. It's like a pyramid, basically. And now chemical reactions, our final topic. So chemical reactions change the composition of matter by making or breaking chemical bonds. It's basically turning from one molecule to another. The reactants are the starting materials while the products are the resulting materials. Key principle, all matter must be accounted for before and after reaction. You've probably heard the law of conservation of mass. Mass is never destroyed or created, it's just changed. Most reactions are reversible. You can change the reactants and products. And an example of a chemical reaction would be Na plus plus Cl minus yields NaCl. This is an ionic reaction. So the reactants are these and the products are these. And this is reversible. So you can also write NaCl yields this. This is the other way. So now this is the reactant and these are the products. This is splitting the salt into its elemental forms. Chemical equilibrium is the reaction is still going on, but there's no net change. Basically, the concentrations of reactants and products are the same. It's still happening, but as this goes here, one product becomes a reactant. And it's written as something like X plus Y, double arrows, A plus B. This is just an example with two variables. And over here, this still changes into this, but as this happens, this also happens. They're, they're at equilibrium. The reaction's still going on, but no net change. They're the same. They have the same concentrations. Like I said, the concentrations have stabilized at a particular ratio. That's it for today's lesson. Thank you for coming. I hope this helps. And next time we're gonna be talking about water and carbon, some of the most important molecules that we need. Thank you.